So once again, my name is Salman Basit, and my colleague Phil Estes <laughs> will talk about container security platforms, uh, container, sec container security, and how that has evolved from from last year and where it is going next. So container security is a hot topic, and we have talked about container security in OpenStack Summit last year and also in the meetups uh, uh, during this year. Uh, there is plenty more information about container security available today than it was year and year before. In this talk, we thought we would um, take a different approach, uh, perhaps a more developer-focused approach on how developers can make use of security that is available through containers that may not be available, or may be difficult to configure when developers run their applications directly on the host. So the talk outline is that we will talk about, you know, obviously, what is containers, very quick overview, what are the threats, uh, what is the evolution, uh, and then uh, focus on running an application, an Apache web server, on a host versus running the same Apache web server on a container on a host and compare you know, which, what are the trade-offs and which one is better. We'll talk about Docker versus LXC versus Rocket in the context of uh, the report published by NCC and we will just also discuss the ongoing work in container security. But before that, let me ask audience uh, this question. So, right, so when you are deploying an application in a cloud, uh, you can either deploy that application uh, on a host, so you, so you can run Apache web server directly on the host, or you can run that Apache web server or any other application inside a container on a host. Do you think, or please raise your hand if you think that running applications on the host is more secure than running applications inside the container on a host. Okay. Please raise your hand if you think that there is no difference in terms of security if you run application inside a host versus you run the application inside a container on a host. Okay. And please raise your hand if you think that running applications inside a, on, a, on the host itself is actually less secure uh, than running applications inside a container on a host. Okay, so that's good. Um, so we think that running applications inside a container on a host is actually more secure than running it directly on, on the host itself. And this is primarily because with containers um, uh, are you know, lightweight, uh, sort of components that allow us running an application and they allow deep visibility and more importantly developer focused and usable security something that is difficult to do with uh, with virtual machines so before we talk in in detail let's uh, uh, you know uh, talk about what a container is and and what are some of the threats and Phil is gonna talk you through the next couple of slides sure Thanks, Solomon. Um, so this may not be new information to, to many people, but I find, as Solomon said, as we've talked about containers in various venues and events over the past couple of years, um, that a lot of times there's this uh, sort of jumping right into the details of, of using Docker or, or Rocket or LXC or whatever container engine you're interested in. Uh, but a lot of people haven't sort of stepped back to understand what does it mean. Uh, I know that there have been other talks in the same room over the past few days that have given you a sense of, of what a container is. But just to revisit that to, to make sure we're all on the same page because these are critical concepts to even understand why, why containers are interesting or why people are, are using this kind of containment uh, to run applications. Um, so there's really two core um, features within Linux that are relied on uh, that, that most of the container engines that we use are, are exploiting to create something that we're calling a container. Uh, it's a different world than, than a virtual machine. In the hypervisor world, it's very clear what we mean when we, when we run a virtual machine. There's all the 
uh, sense of, of booting a system. There's all this virtualized infrastructure, devices, BIOS. A container is not as clear because it's really built on a set of disparate concepts in the Linux kernel, uh, those two main ones being namespaces and C groups. Um, let's talk about namespaces for a minute. There are six uh, namespaces uh, today in the Linux kernel. They uh, did not all appear at the same time. They've, they've appeared over a number of years, uh, the mountain namespace being one of the original ones. Uh, but as the kernel has matured and these namespaces have been added, these are ways that you isolate a process in Linux from the rest of the processes on that system. And so, for example, in the mountain namespace, if I start my process and ask the Linux kernel to give me a new mount namespace, I now see none of the mounts uh, of the original host system or any other contained process on Linux. And so my file system view is, can be different, and obviously that's used uh, heavily in the container world to basically make it appear that I have my own sort of file overlay inside my container. Uh, again, the rest of these, the PID namespace, I only see the processes that are created from my initial um, PID1, so to speak, in my container. Uh, IPC, I can, I can isolate in a process communication. Uh, the network namespace, so my network devices and routes uh, can be isolated from everyone else, so it looks like I have my own network. Uh, UTS just holds the host name and domain name, which is important for obviously applications that rely on, on this sense of they have their own host name and domain. Uh, the user namespace is really one of the, uh, I guess, most recent of the six. Uh, the work was, ha has been done and, and even continues to mature, but most of that only has been around in the Linux kernel and in, in your distro of choice maybe has only appeared in the last few versions. Um, and so user namespaces says, uh, I've isolated all these other things. How about even the user ID and group ID range is shifted from the host such that my process appears it's running as a certain UID, but that's shifted such that if I were able to break out or see other file system mounts or processes, I would be fully unprivileged um, from the rest of the system. So you combine these six, and I don't know if you understand the... Uh, the graphic, but if you ever bought a flat pack box uh, from IKEA, so you know this, you fold this up and, and you now have a, a physical box. And so these namespaces, in essence, create this isolated box around your process and, and, and close it from the rest of the system. C groups, uh, the picture I like to use, kind of are, are the uh, elements that allow my box to shrink or, or grow as necessary because C groups is about resource limiting. So it's great that I've been able to isolate my process from everything else on the system, but I also don't want that process to be able to use all the CPU or all the memory or all the IO bandwidth. And so C groups is another feature of the Linux kernel that has been um, maturing over time. We'll talk uh, in a few minutes about um, new versions of that that have appeared in the Linux kernel with, with more capabilities. But you can basically think of, of C groups again as this control mechanism. I've both isolated my process, but now I also want to limit its capabilities for how much of the host system it can use. And so when we combine these two concepts, this is really what we, uh, most of us should think of when we, when we call something a container. It's namespaced, isolated process that also could be using C groups to control its uh, use of the host resources. So this is um, part of a talk that, that I've been giving at various meetups. Um, one of the things that, that people want to know when they come to containers, and as Solomon said just a few minutes ago, um, security has been both a hot topic but also a fast-moving area, such that a year ago, things that we talked about in Tokyo uh, have changed drastically uh, even in this 12-month cycle of both improvements in the Linux kernel, improvements in engines like Docker or Rocket or LXC. Uh, but here are the things that, that people are curious about when they come to containers. Uh, and first, on the left, we'll think about 
our use model because that may affect how we consider um, what we need to care about with security. So in a single tenant, single tenant trusted code world, um, there may be less concerns about malicious attack vectors because you know, my containers are all running on the same host. No one else's containers are running there. Uh, the code is all from my organization. I've, I've vetted how that code gets into my system. Uh, moving from that to a multi-tenant, but sort of orga organizationally trusted model, it's all on my intranet. Uh, these are all you know, various uh, tenants of my organization. Um, now I have to worry a little more because I've got uh, resource use from different organizations. They, they want to make sure that their resource use is, is validated. So if they ask for 0.5 CPUs, that there's not another con set of containers that's going to uh, use up uh, the CPU and sort of the noisy neighbor problem. Um, and then multi-tenant untrusted code, um, a public cloud model, where I am sharing hosts uh, and allowing containers from different tenants. Um, this is all, obviously you're going to have a lot of the similar risks that you would have to an internet facing application uh, with this added uh, concern about, about malicious neighbors. And so uh, IBM has been operating um, for a few years a public cloud container service um, where Solomon and other folks from our research team have been looking at all these issues and problems and some of the capabilities and enhancements in Docker, in the Linux kernel, have come out of this work. Um, so quickly, uh, some of the threats, you can read them here, I won't read them all for you, uh, but obviously we are going to be concerned with how we protect our host and C groups are going to help us with that and other features that we'll talk about later. We're also going to be concerned with a container's access to information on the host that they shouldn't have access to. Uh, newer features like SetComp, uh, AppArmor, LSMs will obviously enable us to protect c uh, containers from accessing that. Uh, containers have the shared kernel model, so all the containers on a single host are sharing the same kernel, so we don't want underlying kernel information or even the ability for a container to modify information about the kernel. Um, most of the container systems that you're going to use have an API. Uh, many people um, haven't considered what it means to expose that to a large number of users. So uh, how you provide that access, how you limit it is important. And then uh, similarly to anything else that we're going to package up and virtualize, we have to consider what's inside uh, this, this code base to have libraries, to have other binaries, other code that has exploits, that has latent uh, unpatched code. And so the container communities have done a lot of work in the last year on that that we'll look at. Um, and then container provenance, how can I validate, certify that when I ask to run application A, it's really built from the code base from my source code repository uh, combined with some base image that I vetted. Um, is it what I expect, and are there features of, of container runtimes that help with that? And so these are all the things that people have been asking about, considering, and uh, we've seen a lot of activity uh, in the community around that. So at this point, um, as Salman said, we could go through sort of a laundry list of talking about these features and what's new, and, and we'll definitely itemize that toward the end. Uh, but we thought it'd be great to, to really do this comparison. What does it look like uh, for an operator to deploy Apache onto a host versus containerize Apache and deploy it onto a engine like the Docker engine? There's a lot of information out there from, for example, the Center for Internet Security that provide details and best practices to an operator, administrator, on how I should configure my OS. So if, you, if you're using RHEL 7, you can go download their, their report, and you can climb through 304 pages of recommendations, uh, Ubuntu 296 pages. You can download their Apache guide and follow all the best practices across those 163 pages. Um, Docker also has a CIS benchmark document, which has now been updated for Docker 112, 
um, again, 189 pages there. Uh, the, the OWASP rules, again, uh, following these practices, you would go through and as you set up your Apache server, uh, you would make sure that you've configured it according to the best practices for security. Uh, as you can see, this is, as we say, hard and tedious work. Um, will containers solve all these challenges? No, but as we walk through this, hopefully you'll see uh, where containerization and the improvements to container engines have provided um, a lot of uh, shortcuts or provided you with, with capabilities that, that decrease the need for a lot of manual effort. So, uh, as, I, as we said, we're going to look at uh, Apache. Um, you know, based on these security best practices, it's, it's not that containers take away the need for hardening the application, making sure that it's secure, um, but um, as, as you do this and duplicate this over multiple hosts, um, obviously the work, if it is manual, becomes duplicated or needed to be automated through some other system. Containers, uh, we're positing, make it easy to add the security to containerize these best practices and make it usable for both your developer and operator admin. So let's, uh, let's start. Um, Apache web server, obviously very popular. Um, deploying it in a container, uh, we believe as, as we walk through this, uh, can be more secure in a containerized environment. So let's look at the steps uh, involved to do that. Obviously, we're going to have to configure the host file system. Uh, we're going to have to configure the partitions. Um, so as we walk through this, on the, uh, just to give you some clarity, there's a lot of uh, content on these charts. We'll make them available uh, later so you can dig into them in more detail. Uh, but on the left, you're going to see sort of the steps for a Docker host. On the right, you'll see, uh, again, we're not uh, it's not VM or, or bare metal, it's just uh, whatever you perceive as, as a system. Um, obviously, there are, in some cases, going to be some more steps because in the case of containerization, we now need a Docker engine or your container engine of choice. Uh, in this case, you've got Docker, which now has container D and run C, so these things will have to be installed and configured properly, um, again, on your host. Uh, you're going to have to configure that file system and uh, configure the partitions and, and have something like SSH available to do this work. Um, so step two, um, this is one of the first places that we'll talk about specific container features. Um, actually, from IBM, we contribute the user namespace support in, doc in the Docker engine that appeared in Docker 1.10. And so uh, one of the things that you might have to make a choice about with Apache is Apache on a host is going to run as a non-root user, importantly, because you don't want uh, an escape in your, in your web server to be able to now have a malicious privilege on your host. Um, with user namespace support in the Docker engine, um, we could uh, use the capability in Docker to package a container and run it as a, as a non-root user. With user namespaces, that, that ID space is already shifted such that Apache will perceive that it's root inside the container, but it won't be root on the host. So that's uh, obviously a capability that, that gives us um, a step that we don't have to worry about uh, in the containerized environment that we'd have to worry about on the host and gives us a whole deprivileged uh, model of this application, even if there was an escape to root from the other ID with user namespaces, we wouldn't have to necessarily be concerned about that inside the container. Solomon, you want to run through some sure. of the next steps? Yep. Okay. Um, so, you know, we have configured um, separate partitions for Apache, you know, when we're installing Apache on a host, and we have configured separate partitions for, uh, uh, for Docker. I guess Docker is on this side. So separate partitions for Docker and separate partitions for Apache. And then we have configured 
a separate user for Apache and con configured the container engine, in this case Docker, with a, to start containers as, as non-root. Then we want to set up, uh, as an operator and, and developer, we want to set up uh, various uh, monitoring tools. We want to set up logging so that logs can be collected uh, from from the containers uh, running from the app from the Apache running inside a container, or if you're running Apache directly on on the host, you want to configure uh, audit daemons so that system call activity can be tracked. You want to configure monitoring. The key point here is that um, uh, if you were running Apache directly on the host, and we will be configuring all the monitoring, that will be in some sense specific to Apache, uh, or the logging that will be specific to Apache, or will be specific to an application. But when you're running applications inside a host, all, all this stuff is, is configured uh, you know, for a container, and containers just have to write their logs, and they, are, they can be collected by the, the logging demons as well as the audit demons that track system call activities. So in other words, if you're if your uh, host gets compromised when you're running Apache directly on, on the host, uh, then all it, your other information about you know, where your logging servers are, maybe keys, also get compromised. But if your Apache container gets compromised, the attack surface is reduced. Uh, you know, when configuring, so step four is that you know, one has to configure these various network services like NTP, firewalls, DNS, one key difference between uh, running Apache inside a container and running Apache directly on the host is IP forwarding. The Centernet for, of, of Internet Security guidelines require that IP forwarding be disabled on a host, and that is easy to do. But when you're running a container engine, such as Docker or Rocket, the IP forwarding on the host has to be enabled in order for the network to work with the default networking. However, one can disable the IP forwarding inside the container itself uh, by either configuring the container engines, the Docker engines, or by passing appropriate parameters to disable the, the IP forwarding. So step five is, which one has to do both on, on the containerized host as well as the host running Apache, uh, one has to set up software updates or malware agents, and that's a step that's common to both, you know, that, that has to be done regardless. So you know, Phil talked about user um, uh, namespaces and how we should run an application as, as non-root. But in addition to, so that's part of the so-called discretionary access control in Linux. Besides that, it's, it's a prudent thing to configure mandatory access control uh, in, in Linux when you're running various applications. So the Center of Internet Security Profile for Apache requires that when we are running Apache, we should configure the appropriate app armor profile for, for the Apache web server. Configuring that is, is difficult. You know, one has to, to run the profile and see whether it's, it's, the profile is going to work because sometimes it can interfere with the application. But the container runtimes, on the other hand, uh, provide a, a default uh, mandatory access profile that can be used uh, with, um, uh, with all the containers. And that profile can potentially be tuned to, to, for a specific application. So what does these profiles protect against? So as an example, um, uh, you know, the sensitive information related to kernel is, is typically present in the PROC file system or on the PROC sys kernel. And the app armor profile of container engines such as Docker would prevent any, any read or write accesses to the PROC sys kernel, uh, which means that those parameters which are very sensitive to kernel cannot be modified. So Phil talked about C groups and how C groups can, uh, can control the limits available uh, to a container. So imagine if you, uh, Apache was running on a host and suddenly Apache started misbehaving. It could start maybe creating too many processes, sending a lot of network traffic out, maybe going, you know, doing, uh, uh, consuming a lot of CPU. 
And while it's possible to limit uh, the resource consumption of Apache using facilities such as System D or Upstart, uh, you know that that work is error prone and tedious. Uh, you know, one can see here I just listed some some properties such as one can limit memory limits using System D. Um, so that's that can be done, but that's that that's difficult. Container runtimes, on the other hand, make provide a nice and developer-friendly interface to use these control groups to, to limit the resources that are available to a running container or, running, or the Apache web server running inside a container. So they can limit you know, CPU, memory, IO bandwidth, process forks, um, uh, and they can, class, they can tag network traffics um, uh, with uh, certain class priorities, which can then be shaped uh, by uh, Linux uh, tools such as TC. So, you know, we're running the Apache web server as, as uh, non root. We have running it on different partitions, um, and we have taken uh, various other measures to isolate the Apache web server running inside a container from the host. But what else can we do? So there are a couple of other things that can be done, both for Apache running on the host and for Apache running inside a container. This thing called Linux capability. So in the old days, there used to be this Linux root, which, had, you know, which was all powerful root. The capabilities of the root have been divided into some fine-grained capabilities called Linux capabilities. And um, one can configure the Apache web server running as non-root to only use some of those uh, Linux capabilities. And that, that, can, that can be done, but that's, again, manual and, uh, and tedious. Whereas if you're running Apache directly uh, with, on, on a container, you know, most container runtimes will, will um, not uh, use um, any, will only use a subset of the Linux capabilities that are available. So applications, as, as Phil mentioned, that uh, you know, there is a single kernel that, uh, that multiple containers or applications running on a host uh, interact with. And whether applications are running inside a container or whether they are running directly on the host, they will interact with the kernel through system calls. You know, there are 313 plus uh, uh, system calls out there. And some of the system calls are kind of legacy calls that uh, um, you know, may not be in inactive views. And a number of times, the security bugs that are found in kernel are related to those system calls. So one can configure the Apache running on the host, which is already the privilege to further restrict the system calls that can be invoked. Or one can use the, you know, a container engine such as Docker or LXC or Rocket, which would already limit some of the uh, system calls uh, that uh, that uh, a an application can invoke. So that's you know the isolating um, host uh, from from the application, whether the application is running on the host or directly or inside a container on the host. But one has to configure the application in a secure way also. So in this case, the Apache itself has to be configured to make sure that. It, the, it is configured with the right SSL protocols that does not have uh, uh, the unnecessary modules and so on and so forth. And these recommendations apply both to container running, both to Apache running inside a container and to Apache uh, web server running on the host. Although, as I will show shortly, that uh, it's much easier to provide deeper visibility into the application uh, vulnerabilities and configurations um, that make, make these containers uh, much better in terms of security. So once we have done all of these steps, you know, a host is, is isolated from a uh, misbehaving container. Um, so in the event of a compromise, the host can still function. You know, all the data on the host, all your key passwords that maybe your Jenkins had installed and, and configured uh, for various things, uh, are still protected from a misbehaving container. So it's a good thing to run, um, to run applications inside containers uh, uh, on, on the host. And the same mechanisms that we have used to isolate these uh, containers um, from 
the host can be used to isolate containers from one another. So if you were to summarize this and talk about you know, the defense in depth, uh, so as you can see, these capabilities that I've talked about in steps 1 to 10 allow a defense in depth. And the key takeaway from this slide is that if you are using running applications inside a Docker container or inside a Alexi container or a Rocket container or whatever your favorite container platform is, they make it more uh, easy to use, to consume the Linux capabilities, uh, to, to Linux features that uh, isolate hosts from the running containers. Whereas if you're running the applications directly on the host itself, the, all these configurations have to be done manually by the developer. Uh, not on just one machine, but on all the other machines that, that, uh, that uh, the application is set up. And these configurations then become per application, you know, which, which adds to the amount of work that has to be done. So we have observed from, from production that application uh, misconfigurations are among the top causes for container compromise. Right? Uh, no longer, uh, you know, in containers, you're not supposed to run SSH. Um, so probably developers are running their applications. And these applications could be misconfigured. And so wouldn't it be nice if the uh, container platforms, which allow developers to run containers, provide some mechanism to check for vulnerable packages for applications or check for application configurations to make sure they're running with the right you know, TLS or, or right ciphers, etc. So there are many solutions out there in the, in the market providing you know, vulnerable packages. Uh, IBM, IBM's uh, Vulnerability Advisor, which is linked with the IBM Container Service, provides such mechanisms to detect vulnerable packages and also application uh, misconfigurations. So what are some of the new uh, security issues that arise when running applications inside uh, uh, containers? So Phil is going to talk uh, about that and take you to the rest of the slides. All right, thanks, Solomon. So I think we have uh, just five minutes left, so I'm going to go a little quickly through this portion to see if we can save a couple minutes for questions. Um, obviously, there um, are some considerations that you have to, uh, to uh, make decisions about as you move from maybe a traditional model con to containers. Uh, one is this whole concept that, that many container engines run your application as root, so uh, the Docker file and, and other uh, models of, of creating containers can provide uh, ways to work around that. User namespaces is, we believe, um, a key way to to truly isolate and deprivilege privilege containers. Um, there are other considerations here, like the IP forwarding that Solomon mentioned, um, the whole concept of who are you going to give API access to your container um, runtime, uh, because obviously that API is powerful, and if it's not limited uh, through capabilities such as authorization, authentication, um, you can basically provide root access simply by providing full access to the API. So there are those considerations. Uh, but what we've seen and what we believe is that the, the evolution, even in the last 12 to 18 months, of uh, features and capabilities in uh, this slide is focusing on Docker. Many of these features underlie um, or actually overlay on Linux kernel um, improvements, such as um, some of the, the PIDs limit uh, C group limitations, so I can now protect against fork bombs. Uh, that came in kernel 4.3, uh, cgroups v2 that Solomon mentioned earlier, uh, no new privileges, which again is a kernel feature now exposed in both run C and Docker. And then there are other, there are other capabilities that depending on the engine that, that you're using uh, have added things like uh, content trust or uh, content addressability, so validating that, that the layers of an image are exactly what you expected. Uh, quotas, so again, um, handling the fact that containers are basically file systems that you're downloading and you're now allowing a container to write into that file system, how to limit that, uh, and so on. 
one great resource if you're actually looking to compare uh, how these different engines are applying and trying to come up with sane defaults, you can go download, download the NCC group's Understanding and Hardening Linux Containers, which was updated again earlier this year by Aaron Gratifiori, the author. Uh, he walks through, and ag again, there are just hundreds of pages here, but it's extremely well researched and detailed. Um, this is just kind of an overview chart that, that toward the end he, uh, he shows what, it, what he's finding today as far as the defaults in these, um, these different engines. And I think one of the things that, that Solomon alluded to, uh, you can always write your own setcom profile. You can always write your own app armor profile and set up the, uh, a container daemon the way you want. Uh, but it's actually great for uh, these projects to try to come up with same defaults, knowing that many users won't have time or capability or understanding to create those custom profiles. Um, so what's still happening? Um, there's still lots of Linux kernel activity around uh, the container space. There are still parts of the Linux kernel that aren't necessarily namespaced. And so uh, if you get on the containers Linux mailing list, there's discussions every day about uh, different pieces of the system. Should they be namespaced? Should they be included in some of these isolation mechanisms? And so uh, many times it's good to remember that container security work really equals Linux security work, Linux kernel security work. Um, and there's a lot of work going on with hypervisor isolation. Um, maybe you've heard of, of hyper.sh or, or other uh, Intel clear containers. Uh, IBM Research has been doing some work in this area as well. Uh, if, again, we're running out of time, in fact, we're basically out of time, but uh, run C is now a pluggable runtime under the Docker engine. So if you implement the open container initiative interface and use a shim hypervisor, today you could run Docker and have a lightweight hypervisor isolation as well as the kernel isolation. So with that, we're done. Maybe we have time for a quick question uh, before we go. Anybody have a burning question over here? If you want to come to the mic quickly. And then we'll probably dismiss after that. Solomon and I will be up front if you want to discuss more. Uh, do you have any numbers for uh, cost for isolation for every, each and every container? Because you have so many security features. You have a CPU cost for this, per container. Yeah, uh, I haven't seen any, um, any concrete measurement of this. Uh, most people are finding that, compared to many other virtualization technologies, that, that it's a very small cost, but that's worthwhile maybe for a future um, bit of research. Yeah, one, one thing I should mention is that if you were in the VM world and you were running these applications inside the VM on a hypervisor, you have to set up all these security agents per VM. So now, instead of running you know, one security agent or one patching agent per VM, you just have one agent per host. So you can increase the density of applications you can run uh, on, a, on a host by just having one copy of all the various security agents that had to be run. But, you know, Quantifying that cost, I think, still needs to be done. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Simon.